All right, guys. Here we go. Five, four, three. Hi, and welcome back to Inspiring Honesty. I'm hoping that our internet connection will stick around this time, but uh, specifically because I am ready to beat up on Bob a little bit. Um, so, uh, Bob, when we, we left off, um, you had made the statement that because the FDA is a, a corrupt organization, we cannot know what we can trust and what we cannot trust from them. Is that correct? Their, cred their credibility is compromised. Okay. And, and I will agree um, to that, to, to a large extent, that there is a, um, a, certainly a degree of, uh, of compromised credibility, at least on one side uh, of the coin, um, greater than the other, that uh, they have incentive specifically to allow things before they are as thoroughly tested as they possibly should be. Um, but they also do have a, a great deal of consentive, or sorry, incentive to uh, disallow things when they are shown to be either dangerous or ineffective. Would you at I, least agree to that part? No, no. I, I think that they're, I think that they are compromised on both ends of that equation. Okay. Well, and even if we, we do grant that, what yeah. I was about to say before the, the break there was, are you familiar with the genetic fallacy? Yeah, sure. It's a fallacy so just, where you believe that something is, uh, that just because of where it comes from, uh, it somehow is therefore um, false. Right. I am positing that that is what you are doing with this question. Um, I, I think that you are taking the, uh, the genetic fallacy from saying that the FDA is making these statements, therefore we, I, I, I know that you didn't say that they're false, but we can't trust them. We, we don't know which direction we should go with them. Um, well, that's not the genetic fallacy. The genetic fallacy the is genetic the fallacy. conclusion based solely on the fact that, uh, of where it's coming from. I said, you know, we don't know what we can do. I, they, there may be things they say that are just totally trustworthy, and there may be things they're saying that we can't trust. And uh, it's going to require, because their credibility is compromised, it's going to require um, that, uh, that it be independently reestablished. And that's not a genetic fallacy. A genetic fallacy would be, uh, for example, not trusting someone because they're black, even though they have never done anything to give you any reason to distrust them. That's a genetic fallacy. The FDA has given us reasons to not trust them. And so that is not a genetic fallacy. They have earned the lack of credibility that they have. It's terribly unfortunate because there may be many very useful, true things they're saying that some people are not as open to hearing because you just don't know. But it is an earned mistrust. It is not a genetic fallacy. Okay, you know, I will, I will grant that. I will withdraw that accusation then because I think you made a okay. good point. I mean, for, for example, um, I, I absolutely agree with sources like World Net Daily or Fox News that they are extremely biased, um, or, or even the Huffington Post, um, extremely biased in the opposite direction. Therefore, sure. um, we should approach these things with skepticism or any statements or claims that they make with skepticism and attempt to independently verify wherever we can. Well, I would say that even that is a genetic fallacy in a sense. When I say, um, for example, in, in programming, computer programming, uh, there are some languages that require you to declare a variable and declare its value. And prior to that time, its value is unknown. By unknown, um, th we shouldn't assume, you know, skepticism, trust, or anything. It is, it is just simply unknown. And well, I think that, that, that is what I mean by skepticism, though. I, I'm not demeaning. Okay. I, okay. I'm sorry. I'm taking the uh, the more scientific skepticism it, approach in which I generally yeah. use the term. It's uh, it, uh, that it's not should. as if I hear something coming from the FDA and I go, well, <laughs> I don't know about that. I mean, look who's saying it, the FDA. I don't have that reaction. But where does the FDA come up with these decisions? So, and through what processes do they determine these things? Is it testing? Do they publish results? Sure. I mean, the FDA, it's an organization, right? And we can look into the information that they have available and other information that is accessible. Right. Um, so specifically, this, this topic has come up about vaccinations and about genetically modified organisms and the safety and efficacy 
of the the two. Um, in that, uh, I believe with vaccinations, we've uh, we've discussed. You you've said that we, or there, there's certainly incentive for the FDA to say that they should be administered and to recommend them and to say that they're safe um, because they they have this um, relationship with uh, the business interests that are associated there that uh, will, of course, profit and make money from the sale of these uh, vaccinations. Is that correct? I don't believe that you and I have ever talked about vaccines other than you bringing up Jenny McCarthy and comparing it to be similar to what I've said about GMOs. I don't know that I've ever talked to you about uh, We did a show about vaccines vaccines a while back, and you mentioned your skepticism on, on that or your... Your hesitance to take it. Uh, that's I, I. This was not hesitance. recent. This actually... Hesitance is perhaps a good a good uh, word. Uh, hesitance does not mean that I, I reject it. Uh, none of that. But I would I would think that chances are very high, just from the standpoint of of probability and an understanding of human nature, that probably most vaccines do possess a certain degree of effectiveness. Uh, or they wouldn't be marketed, and they, they could. I mean, you know, after all, if if somebody was, uh, for example, selling a a smallpox vaccine, and yet tons of people are coming down with smallpox, well, obviously, you know, something's not right. So, uh, no doubt, the smallpox vaccine, for example, is effective. No doubt, many of the vaccines are effective, but in terms of how safe they are, uh, I think that many times they are very open to dismissing and very open to accepting, knowing full well that the data has been skewed or taken in a way deliberately to, uh, 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 you know, mask it, uh, that there are many more negative responses to uh, the vaccines than they're willing to admit to. And in other words, it's, it's, it's not perfect. Even if it's really the best compromise we can come up with, I don't think they're being totally honest about it. You know, I'm I'm having a, a difficult time with uh, taking that one. Once again, Bob, you're you're super reasonable in many of these, so it's it's difficult to to criticize this. The the question, though, and when when I said that it's a uh, a harmful way of reasoning, uh, is because not everybody, and as a matter of fact, the the vast majority of people are not capable. Um, they're not equipped with the the education or the knowledge to make these assessments independent of what is recommended to them. And yet, by true, true. taking on yeah. the, uh, I, I guess, the recommendation that you're making, that they be more skeptical and they, they, they look into these questions themselves and to, uh, to sort of weigh the values, means that we're putting a lot more of the responsibility for these decisions on the people who are ill-equipped to make them. Right, and that's exactly what the FDA was supposed to do, and they're not doing it. That's why we have an FDA. They're supposed to be an organization filled with people whose expertise, knowledge, and education equips them to be making this sort of thing uh, because the truth is your average person does not possess that kind of skill. And because we don't possess that kind of skill, we not only can't counter uh, the claims that are being made, we wouldn't even know that the claims possess any sort of credibility problem, most of us. I, I can't, again, I can't disagree that if the FDA was a perfect organization in that, then uh, we'd, we'd have what we needed. But the FDA is not the only organization that's similar. We have the American Medical Association. We have the World uh-huh, Health Organization. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't trust them that much either, uh, mainly because I think their credibility has been compromised by the degree to which they're underwritten by the pharmacological organizations. You can't get a degree in medical school these days without that, without the equipment and a lot of the stuff that's done in that school being paid for by a great, a, to a great deal by the donations of a lot of these pharmacological organizations. And that, uh, this is why I'm, I'm you know saying is where the genetic fallacy is coming from. Just because they're funded by these. Uh, does not no, mean that they are necessarily. No, this is not the genetic fallacies. We have.
various ways in which we've documented in which this conflict of interest has come to light. So it's an earned lack of credibility. It's not, oh, well, just look at how, you know, it's like if you were to tell me something and uh, that, that vouches for your cousin and I say, well, he's your cousin, you know, but I don't have any evidence to indicate that just because he's your cousin, you're lying. That's the, gen you know, that's the genetic fallacy. I don't think it's a genetic fallacy when we can demonstrate, for example, uh, you know, when mathematicians argue with the pharmacological companies in their misuse of statistics in the way that they do not uh, properly deal with all the potential causes of correlation when they explain things and then doctors go to school and they come away and they believe they've been taught an actual causation based upon the statistics because although they may be smart people, they don't necessarily understand statistics. And we see this thing happening time and time again in a way that, you know, and this is the unfortunate thing about when you try to explain statistics to most people, their eyes just glass over. And as a result, you're ended up really talking to an audience of zero uh, so that people don't know what you're talking about. I'm saying these people in the pharmacological um, industry know exactly what they're doing and messing around with the way they're misrepresenting statistics and that they're also then helping the medical society in a manner that causes us to find their credibility is compromised. I'm not saying that we can't trust everything or anything that they do. I'm just saying that uh, we got something going on here that is not uh, not really um, uh, selling this well. But who can we trust then? That's the, the point that I'm making is you're saying all of these doctors are corrupted because you can't get through medical school without this um, this equipment and this funding and, and with the influence of these pharmacological organizations. And, and you then we have the, the pharmacy has reps that are going out and promoting these drugs to doctors who are then promoting them on to other people. Um, and, and that scientists- And I'll tell you what, these doctors these don't know a damn thing about the pharmacology. I, I, I had lung surgery. I, I'll agree, I actually. Most doctors, medical doctors are not research right. scientists. I had, so. I had, well, yeah, I mean, but, but I'll tell you, they're relying upon the statistics and the correlations and the evidence given to them by these pharmacological organizations. Uh, and because they use the pr professional talk, I, I had my lung, uh, had a lung partially removed. I had the upper lobe of my lung removed. And I told the doctor w when I was recovering, I said, look, you need to know something that I am powerfully insomniac. And at that time I was, I said, I can't have any painkillers that have caffeine in them. And he said, oh, oh, okay. And so he subscribed for me this like $200 medicine. And I didn't have any um, I didn't have any coverage for um, for uh, prescriptions at the time. That was some very expensive medicine. And I didn't sleep for three days on this medicine. And I finally, this was back in the, the early 80s before the internet was really very popular. I had to go down to the local library and I looked in the physician's desk reference for this drug. And the thing was loaded with caffeine, you know, and uh, you know, and I had specifically talked to this doctor about it. So I'm telling you, ask me, who can you trust? That's a good question because I'll tell you that, uh, you know, my experience is that the kind of quality care you get from a doctor may actually really depend on, you know, what, uh, what sector of society you come from when you need their services and how, how much your insurance company is going to pay. Because I tell you, I've, I, I found that, um, you know, many times they don't know what they're doing. And I had to go down to the library and, and research these drugs and come back and say, how about prescribing for me this, you know? And, um, you know, I remember once I had a, I had a doctor, I told him that I had a very bad reaction to amitriptyline and he suggested that we should subscribe for me Elevil, which is amitriptyline. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> come on, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I'm not, I'm not convinced that these doctors possess a good track record. And I don't know how many people knew, but even back then, how many people are educated enough to know they could go down to the local library and find a, a physician's desk reference, you know? No, and, and I do have to, to agree that oh, there's, uh, this is where I, I recommend good scientific skepticism because it, there is a very large difference between trusting an individual medical doctor um, or, or even a group of medical doctors that's a, a small group um, or non-research doctor. A, a group of medical doctors, as long as they're not research doctors, all they're doing is going by the information that they have. And some of them are going to be better equipped to analyze these things or more inclined to do so, whereas others right. are going to simply take things that they're told at face value. Yeah. So you're right, absolutely right that there is a, a greater responsibility for us to do more research into the research 
and, yeah. and what has really been said and found about this. But I have to go back to what what the, the skepticism or the skeptic in me is going to say every time that I am not. You're breaking up. Equipped. I can't hear you. The skeptic oh. in you is saying what? It, it, that I am not equipped to approach a question about a pharmacological issue or safety any better than the the consensus of the experts researching it. Um, okay, uh, you're breaking up, so unfortunately I can't hear you. Joe, is he breaking up to you? Because um, I hopefully he's not going over the air that I can't hear what Greg is saying. I'm going to wait for Joey to respond on yeah. that one. Uh, guys, uh, you're both sounding really good. Um, I'm not sure okay, what to yeah. tell you. Okay, then, Greg, try that again then. Resp uh, tell me what was you, right. you had just said I couldn't hear. Um, I, I'm saying that I am not equipped to make a decision that is contrary to what the the vast majority of experts researching I, on that subject. Sure. Uh, no, I'm not either. So uh, that's where the the only the the criticism I'm making of of your approach here and saying that that we you broke up again. That's where what the the criticism I'm I'm having of your approach to the question of GMOs, um, the genetically modified organisms, is that of all of the research I have ever seen published, the meta-analyses of this research from the experts uh, and, and things that have looked into the, the sheer number of surveys uh, or of studies that have been done, the vast majority of them have all been in support of the conclusion that GMOs are no more dangerous for human consumption than the natural organic plants are. Yeah, I would agree with you that that is the state of affairs uh, inside the vast majority of the research. True. Okay, so then the conclusion that I'm going to draw from that is it is dangerous for us to then condemn them simply because we don't have infinite knowledge of them that they have been thoroughly researched oh, i yes, totally agree learn. with you that would be extremely irresponsible and dangerous but that is not what i'm doing well i i tried to find the actual thread and and see where we were uh yeah. where we were going with I, it but uh, it was hard I, for me to i'm not disagreeing with them because i know better I'm not doing that. I'm not disagreeing with them because I know researchers that I trust even more. I'm saying that because given the fact that there is a ton of money involved and given the fact that, that so many people who work for the FDA are former legal uh, uh, people who used to work for Monsanto and the fact that so many of these people have been involved in creating legislation that exempts and indemnifies these companies from various things for reasons God only knows why they know they need to do that. I am saying that, you know, I'm seeing things that smell bad to me, that tell me somebody's covering something up because they're covering something up. And yet maybe all the data is coming out and showing us certain things. But, you know, like, for example, you quoted for me this one guy who was criticizing that test of the 168 pigs. And you even defended it by saying, well, he's not giving us a scientific uh, you know, analysis here, but he is, he's making reference to it. Um, you know, I found that to be what he did to be totally unscientific. You know, if, if, if he wanted to find that that uh, – I mean, for example, are you telling me that the study of those 168 pigs did not actually turn up the results they claimed it turned up? Um, well, I'm, I'm once again looking for that one so I can look back through the – the question this is the bit, Australian I'm, I'm study. And, and by the way, did you but, know that uh, in the United States of America, you cannot do studies on GMOs independently uh, and, and without going through a very uh, great number of legal problems that you're going to have? Because first of all, to even study them, you have to get a hold of them. And to get a hold of them, you have to sign documents. And you are, you know, you, you have to pay royalties. You know, so it's, it's not as simple. This was a study that was actually done in Australia because in the United States, it's very difficult to do independent studies that are not controlled by uh, people who have a dog in the fight. You know, Why I'm not familiar with that. And I'm, I'm not familiar either with where you've 
gotten that information. It's oh, something that uh, I, was on my, I, I it was on my page. You even quoted it. You gave me a guy who who was uh, he was making fun of and uh, he was assessing the bogusness of a study that was done in Australia of 168 pigs where they divided them in half and created a double blind study where they fed a oh, yes, GMO. Uh, to uh, half of them and non-GMO to the other half, and then they they did blind study autopsies on all of these pigs, and they found that uh, that a certain number of these pigs had moderate to severe inflammation in their stomachs, and the severity of this was registered and photographed, and then cataloged by scientists who had no clue whether or not they were autopsying a GMO fed or a non-GMO fed pig, and then the results were were brought together, and there was a a high level of inflammation uh, found in the GMO fed pigs as opposed to the others. Now, that was a scientific study. There is a cause for this. And the proper way to make fun of that study or to debunk it is to duplicate it. Well, there, that is one proper way. You, you brought that up. But uh, yeah, now that I, I'm looking at that particular quoted uh, portion, um, the other way, the, the, the thing that um, this particular author did was criticize the methodology. Um, and, and I believe he actually quoted others who um, criticized the methodology within a peer review setting. So the people that were experts in the field um, that were saying the way that they assessed inflammation was visually and based on color. Uh, and that is not a, uh, an accurate or even a particularly useful way of assessing um, okay, you're inflammation. Break, breaking up again, but I would disagree with you that that was the basis of their, you know, they also used uh, calipers to determine the thickness of the skin of the, you know, or of the thickness of the, the stomach wall itself. He says uh, specifically, I, I'm, I'm looking at the, the link itself, um, that the only way to really accurately determine um, inflammation, particularly in a stomach, which is uh, what these ones were looking at, I thought it was lungs, but it, it seems it was stomach. Um, is to look at the tissue itself and check for the biological signs of it. Oh, and you're, I've lost you completely, by the way. I can't hear a thing you're saying. Uh, but from where you dropped off, I, uh, Joey, let me know if I'm not being heard, uh, if you know it. Um, the, uh, you know, so he can talk about what they should have done, but he has not demonstrated that they didn't do that. In fact, I'll tell you something. Uh, one of the things that I discovered about the uh, even the psychiatric community, which really turned me off. Uh, let me talk to you about a guy I don't I don't.